Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to the uh, second day of our webinar series, a uh, talk series. Um, we are grateful that you all have joined us from uh, for this three day webinar from different parts of the world, so to speak from about 20, 25 countries around the world. And from a number of universities and colleges across India, so we are very happy um, in a real sense, this has become an international webinar. Um, I welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Germanic Studies, the English and Foreign Languages in, uh, University from Hyderabad in India. We are extremely grateful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor for allowing us to hold this seminar and uh, also to uh, organize this series of talks as an international webinar. We also thank the technical team at EFLU um, we've had heavy rains in Hyderabad uh, since almost 48 hours now, and we have a massive power cut. Uh, almost 15 year, 15 hours, it uh, it was uh, there was no power. So in case, like we are running now on a generator, and in case things go wrong, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. But in case suddenly we vanish, um, I hope you all will understand. So um, I would like to start now by introducing our um, speaker of the day. I welcome Professor Frederica Middelhoff. Uh, she has studied German literature, linguistics and English literature at IMU, at JMU Würzburg and at the University of Exeter in UK. Professor Middelhoff has uh, received her doctoral degree in February 2019 for her outstanding study on history and cultural contexts of animal autobiography in German speaking countries. Her thesis has been published recently as a book by Metzler Verlag in Jan 2020. She worked as a postdoc researcher in the, at the University of Hamburg and since March 2020 she is Professor of German Literature and Romantic Studies at the Goethe University of Frankfurt. Her research interests range from cultural animal studies, plant studies, and eco-critical theory to multilingual literature, mobility, and migration studies. This week, her article titled Durenmatt Stierer will be published in the Durenmatt Handbook. She is also researching relationships between plant and animal studies, as well as working on an edited volume on animals and migration. Professor Middelhoff is working on a new project which explores theoretical, artistic, and scientific uh, contexts in which the romantics discussed and depicted various forms, experiences, and consequences of migration. Professor Middelhoff, it is a privilege to have you as our esteemed speaker today. We are looking forward to your talk. And now I hand over the mic to you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me, uh, Anu Pande and Anjali Pande, and also the Department um, of Germanic Studies. Um, it's a real pleasure um, to be speaking to you today. And yeah, keep fingers crossed that um, the electricity uh, gets running and keeps on running. Um, my talk today quite nicely fits in with uh, Roland Borgart's on Monday because I will be uh, concerned with cats as well. Um, but I'm going to be going a bit um, further back in time to uh, E.T.R. Hoffmann's um, Tom Cat Moore. Um, I'm now trying to share my um, slides with you. So this is the title of my talk. You've already seen um, it um, being announced and I'm just diving in um, right away. If um, my microphone is not working for some uh, reason, please just interrupt um, and let me know what I can do. Okay, so texts giving voice and face to animals by narrating their lives and representing their experiences from a first-person perspective 
have been part of Western literary history, and this is what I'm concerned with today, and simultaneously dismissed from these canons for more than 200 years. It comes as no surprise that we find companion animals, especially horses, dogs and cats, the most popular species to feature as life narrating subjects. Since they have co-evolved with and been selectively bred by humans, companion animals seem not only close to us in cultural and biological terms, rather they also find themselves included in the legal realm of what we call, at least colloquially and casually, personality and subjectivity. In the following, I want to discuss animal autobiographies as literary autozoographies, as I've um, tried to do in my um, PhD thesis. Um, so what are literary autozoographies? The term I came up with denotes texts that have a homodiegetic animal narrator, so the narrating animal is identical with the animal protagonist, they showcast an animal protagonist who does not metamorphose or speak to human protagonists in human tongues, as is the case in many fables, in parables, and in fairy tales. And they retrospectively um, narrate uh, an animal's life and therefore adopt, assimilate, and sometimes also subvert conventional autobiographical paradigms and, which um, is something I want to be concerned with today, um, first and foremost, they reflect and affect zoological knowledge and popular and oftentimes stereotypical discourses on animal species. Literary autosographies narrate an animal's life and construct a more than human self that tends to oscillate between the pose of a naive and critical anthropomorphism species knowledge and imaginative approaches to realms of the unknowable between anthropocentric appropriation and interspecies communication. Autozoographical research not only focuses on the representations and constructions of animal selves, it is also interested in how these representations contribute to zoological discourses and perceptions of animal species in a specific time and place. The term zoon in autozoographies thus draws attention to the fact that live narrating animals, just as literary animals in general, are enfolded in and can neither be fully grasped without its historical zoological context nor without taking the lives of real animals into account. Traditionally, critics and scholars have tended to read literary autosographies exclusively as satirical narratives. One of the first autosographies that I um, have come across in my work um, was um, the Lebensgeschichte eines Miepferdes, also Life of a Job Horse, um, published in 1799, and that was reviewed in 1800 as, quote, entailing some satirical sparks here and there, but still too little to raise itself above mediocrity. Yeah, so um, very much critical of what um, this uh, Ambrosius Speckmann, which is, of course, not the real name of the author, has published. Very similarly, um, E.T.R. Hoffmann's Tomcat Moor, uh, which some of you um, studying um, German literature might know, um, very similarly, um, Tomcat Moore has been interpreted as cat buffoonery and social satire, this is a quote by uh, Gergens, or as an elaborative travesty of contemporary German novelistic practices. So far, Hoffmann's scholarship has tended to sideline both the links between Moore's representation and zoological discourse on domestic cats around 1800, and the fact that the autobiographical Tomcat Moore actually had a real counterpart living and interacting with Hoffmann. Departing from here, I'd like to invite you to a reading of literary autosographies from the perspective of discourse analysis and a history of knowledge. What I'm trying to show is how literary representations of autosographical animals depend on, deflect, reflect and participate in zoological discourse and how they can be seen to challenge and modify beliefs and knowledges regarding specific animal species. 
In a second step, I aim to examine the interrelations of real and fictional animals and their respective owners. Taking E.T.R. Hoffmann's feline autosography as an example, I want to demonstrate that literary autosographies not only negotiate and shape zoological discourse, but may also incorporate and reflect extratextual human-animal relationships and thus record real animal lives. So this would be the uh, plan of the guided tour um, for today. We start with um, what's at stake and what how we can theorize um, the narration of animal selves from a first per person's perspective. Live narrating animals can refer to but do not always have extra textual counterparts, surely. Although it is likely that many authors were inspired to write about a specific animal known to or even living with the author, many historical narratives do not allow us to draw a connection between real and literary animals. We cannot tell whether the job horse that I've um, just shown you or um, whether um, this Amante um, is uh, the, the horse is called um, in Die Lebensgeschichte der Mecklenburgischen Stute Amante from 1804, um, or whether Zoddel, the um, narrator and protagonist of um, Emmerich Ranzoni's Zoddel, eine Lebensgeschichte. I, I haven't been able to find out whether these animals actually existed before the stories um, about their lives was being told. Yet there are many cases where we can um, draw from contextual material um, or the text themselves um, that um, this animal that whose stories is being narrated um, has actually lived. Um, I've just brought along a couple of um, examples here. Um, Beautiful Joe um, by uh, Margaret um, Saunders, um, a story about a, um, a stallion, a Lipisana stallion, um, from the 20th century, um, Klinkenborg's um, Timothy um, notes of an abject reptile um, published in 2006. It's about a turtle. Um, Angus and also um, some of you might know uh, Yoko Tavada's uh, Etuden im Schnee talking about um, the actual polar bears Tosca and her son Knut, um, whom some of you might know him from um, the zoo, the Berlin Zoo, this um, massive media event um, surrounding uh, Knut the polar bear. They, these are stories told from the perspective um, of um, the animals um, where we can say that these, these animals are in the text are material semiotic animals, extra textual individuals reconfigured as characters and imaginatively enriched, so to speak, as narratives of their own lives. These animals appear in, but have also existed apart from the textual world. Why could this be important for a reading of literary autosographies? First, it can enable us to question the unilateral essentialist notion of authorship and in step, instead help us argue, at least in some cases, for notions of more than human collaborative authorship. I will, will return to this aspect in a moment. Second, recognizing and investigating the connections between real and life narrating animals provides us with a crucial means to grasp the representations of autosographicals, uh, autosographical animals, the form of the narrative and the functional layers of a specific text. To be sure, writers of literary autosographies cannot relinquish their inherent epistemological anthropocentrism. Human knowledge is always subject to and limited by strictly human-centric perspectives, as is human language, which renders anthropomorphism a basically inevitable um, feature in literary autosographies. Furthermore, many readers of literary autosographies disregard the fact that seemingly realistic depictions of animal minds and perceptions in the first person of an animal's life um, depend on a cognitive um, illusion, as Marco Caracciolo has um, convincingly argued. This illusion, Caracciolo, uh, Caracciolo writes, encourages the audience to read a representation of mind in a predominantly mimetic mode as a convincing rendering of non-human experience. So an olfactory-centered canine perspective 
um, and uh, phenomenology, as we find in Franz Kafka's investigations of a dog, for example, can make us believe that we can embrace through the mediation of language a non-human way of being in the world. Yet we have to acknowledge that this is um, a cognitive illusion at this um, point. Language in this respect is not um, available to the animal presented in this um, respect. Employing the first person perspective, literary autobiographies exhibit that this perspective yeah, this first person perspective is a necessarily anthropomorphic fictive construction. In fact, any verbal rendition of animal mind speed in literature or in ethology finds itself mired in this fundamental paradox. How to narrate an, exper an animal experience that is, world is wordless, yeah, wordless, but certainly not wordless, um, wordless voice. Or speechless. Throughout recent decades, ethological research has come to acknowledge that narrative is crucial to investigate and describe non-human life, realizing that each animal has its own story to tell, as Franz de Waal um, has um, written in 2005. Similarly, some autobiographical writers seem to have tried to empathetically approach an animal's perspective. It can be suggested, and this is what I do, that something akin to Kenneth Shapiro, um, um, his description um, of a kinesthetic empathy happened in some of the poetics of literary autobiographies. Um, Shapiro um, 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 features an interpretive uh, investigative posture, a kinesthetic empathy um, at in play and at play, a corporeal and embodied interspecies engagement that aims to move into the world of animals. So not only observing, but living and interacting with in a very um, em em emphatical sense. This empathetic engagement, Shapiro notes, effectively, effectively develops a biographical account. Attentive to and actively engaging in the ways individual animals behave, move and interact, some autosographical writers, I assert, venture to invent, imagine and reconfigure the shared spaces and interrelating lives from a non-human perspective. In such accounts, animals are not excluded from, but actively participate in the making of a text as part of a multi-species project. Or, to speak with um, Aaron Moe, a zoopoetics. When a writer, um, this is here, genau, when a writer undergoes the making process of poiesis in harmony with the gestures and vocalizations of non-human animals, this is a co-making, a joint venture. In this respect, we can analyze literary autosographies, as that which David Harmon suggests as acts of speaking for that cross species lines, acts that can range, acts of speaking for that cross species lines, acts um, that um, can range on a continuum between butting in and chipping in. This is what um, Herman refers to um, when he talks about um, trans species um, speaking for. Um, which the one being speaking on behalf, yeah, this chipping in is speaking in favor of speaking as a representative, speaking um, at um, um, face value yeah, and, and at, a, at the same level, so to speak, um, and um, human centric butting in, so an anthropocentric um, speaking um, not, uh, not for, not as a representative, but um, um, patronizingly, speaking patronizingly. And on this kind of these two poles, like butting in, like um, speaking um, um, patronizingly and chipping in as um, speaking for, speaking as a representative, on this continuum, we can um, try to evaluate how um, um, writers engage in writing about um, and with um, cross speaking uh, or acts of cross speaking. Um, uh, for um, with other animals. 
So it is obvious that many um, literary autobiographies and related genres in which animals are given narrative authority fall into this butting in category, yeah, as they are concerned first and foremost with human subjects and capitalist um, ideologies, exploiting animal perspectives for voyeuristic commercial or political perspectives. The canine narrator Millie in Barbara Bush's um, Millie's book, for example, closes her account on our life at the White House with a very biased commercializing um, statement. She says, I know the Bushes love me, but they love people more, all people. So I've written this book and proceeds will go to help people, all people. I hope it will strengthen the families and family life in our great America. This is 1990 um, and of course Barbara Bush is um, the mother of um, uh, George W. Bush. Um, she has died in 2018, I think, but um, this book is written from um, her dog's perspective um, and looking around uh, the, the White House and um, so sniffing out what, um, what happens there. Um, in these kind of um, contemporary popular posthumous narratives, as um, Cynthia Huff and uh, Joe Hafner have uh, explained, um, these narratives appropriate species subjectivities for political and rhetorical purposes. Indeed, most literary autosographies give us ample information about human perceptions and individual attachments to companion animals. From a historical perspective, these texts can thus be indicative of what, of what kind of capabilities, feelings and subjective states humans attribute to companion animals in general, individual members of a species in particular, at a spe specific time and in a specific, specific cultural context. In turn, the particular cultural historical context in which a text is embedded can provide us with an epistemological framework to investigate acts of speaking for that cross species lines. In this respect, literary autosographies can help us grasp how literature has been participating in and contributing to the knowledges, perceptions and treatments of animals. A case in point for this is E.T.R. Hoffmann's Life and Opinions of the Tomcat Moor, um, which I um, further on will be discussing in the excellent translation by Anthea Bell um, from 1999. I will in the following I try to illuminate how representations of animal selves in literary autosographies are not only firmly entrenched in and responsive to a text historical scientific context, but how they also hinge on an author's engagement with and dedication to a specific real individual animal. Hoffman presents us with a counter narrative to zoological and popular narratives on cats in Germany around 1800 affecting how 19th century zoological discourse engages with and evaluates cats, while also leaving the mark of his Berlin cat for posterity. Itja Hoffmann's The Life and Opinions of the Tomcat Moor is an extraordinary book, um, not only for its proto-modernist experimentality. The novel presents itself as a concoction of animal autobiography, human biography, and intertwining human and animal life in the story as well as in the form. As the editor of the book, called Hoffmann, tells us in the foreword, the reason for this quote-unquote oddly assorted hodgepodge lies in the fact that the autobiographical cat had used Kapellmeister Johannes Kreisler's biography as blotting and writing paper. The result is a text which has the autobiographical cat narrative interrupted again and again by extracts from Chrysler's biography. As aforementioned, most scholars have been eager to read the text as a work of social satire, autobiographical parody and intertextual work of art. Reluctant to conceive of the feline narrator and the cat protagonist as just that, a cat with special skills like reading and writing on the one hand and with ethologically sound feline behavior on the other hand. A cat growing up and interacting with humans, cats and dogs. So why could the depiction of a cat like Moore living and communicating with humans be of any relevance from a historical and an animal studies point of view? 
First, Moore's representation and transspecies relations can be regarded as a counter-narrative to the disparagement of the cat and its denial of companionship value we find in the accounts of natural history around 1800. Moore, by contrast, is an integral part in an accepted member of the Oikos he shares with the servants and master Abraham, who has taken him in as a kitten. In this respect, the novel also prefigures the revelation the re-evaluation of cats in German zoological discourse in the second half of the 19th century. Second, the book forces its readers to question whether the, there is indeed such a thing as the cat. Moore is represent, represented not as one of many, but as one of a kind, proposing a model of animal individuality beyond species paradigms, as dictated by the tableau of natural history. And third, the cat's representation is indicative of Hoffmann's emotional attachment to and interaction with his own cat, called, unsurprisingly, Moore, with whom he had lived in Berlin between 1818 and 1821. In this regard, Hoffmann's tomcat and his relationship to the poet can be traced in the text. Moore was not only the inspiration for, but has also been participating in the composition of the novel Tom Cat Moore. At least this is what I'm um, trying to get at. So first, the, um, let's go to the um, zoological um, um, part of um, what's in Carter Moore, so to speak. The European history of cats as undisputed members of the household and as companion animals is a rather young one. In um, Johann Heinrich Zedlers Großes Vollständiges Universallexikon aller Wissenschaften und Künste, um, the domestic cat did not even have its own entry. So this is um, early 18th century. In 1781, the renowned Ökonomische Enzyklopädie um, had an entry on Hauskatze, domestic cat, um, as the cat kept in houses in contrast to wild cats. The following, um, my, the translations of the German um, are mine. Um, I want to indicate that. It is telling that the dictionary speaks of cats being kept in the house, not living in them. Around 1800, as um, Roland Borgatz has um, already indicated in his talk on Monday, cats were not considered as cohabitants, but rather as reluctantly tolerated half-wild beneficiaries of human settlements decimating mice and rats, populating pantries and granaries. The Ökonomische uh, Encyclopädie thus maintains that cats are wont to stay in our homes, yet one cannot really regard them as pets, because even the tamest cannot be used for domestic service. Rather, they must be called completely free, as they only do what they want. In contrast to dogs, cats were regarded as willful, uncontrollable and unpredictable beings who could neither be subdued to human dominance nor entirely included into domestic spaces. When Hoffmann published his feline autosography in 1820, cats were regarded as useful natural mouse traps, but hardly ever appreciated as companions. Cats appeared as liminal, ambivalent characters half wild, half domesticated, half in, half outside the house, half part of, half apart from human consideration. Furthermore, cats were regarded as devious, dishonest animals. In popular and zoological discourse, cats traded under the names of thieves, betrayers and psychophants. While the dog was hailed for loyalty and servitude, the cat was devalued as treacherous and unsociable. One of the most pertinent voices in the discourse attributing negative characteristics to, 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 um, to domestic cats was Georges-Louis Leclerc de Buffon. In his canonical Histoire naturelle, générale et particulière, Buffon condemns the cat as the most unpleasant and dangerous of all domestic animals. The cat is a faithless domestic and only kept through necessity. For we pay no respect to those who, being fond of all beasts, keep set cats for amusement. These animals possess an innate, cunning and perverse disposition, which ace increases. 
They all naturally, they are all naturally inclined to theft, and the best of education only converts them into servile and flattering robbers. Like all knaves, they know how to conceal their intentions, to watch, wait, and choose opportunities for seizing their prey. It is intriguing that Buffon ascribes capabilities and characteristics to cats, which one would traditionally accept as exclusively human. To be cunning, cats have to be at least rudimentarily um, intelligent. To conceal intentions, they have to possess intentional states in the first place. To conceal, um, to con to conceal they have to be able to deceive and first and foremost know how to. Yeah? They need to have mental states and be able to pick and choose and also to desist. To put it bluntly, cats, according to before, may be said to act like humans, albeit very morally dubious ones. So for Buffon and a number of other German natural historians of the 18th and early 19th century, a cat's presence in the household was nothing but a nuisance. Luckily, according to uh, Buffon, cats never dwell in human company for a long time, as most of them um, he says, are half wild, know not their masters, frequent other granaries and never visit the kitchens and offices belonging to the house. If we look at reassessments of cats in the second half of the 19th century, however, Hoffmann's autozoographical cat can be regarded as a prototype of a revisioned zoological understanding of cats. A discourse which dismissed conventional proverbs and derogatory accounts of domestic cats, of domestic cats as prejudiced, and um, which um, proclaimed that uh, the species as an affectionate, underestimated companion animal. According to the cat's most prominent zoological advocate in Germany, Alf Alfred Edmund Brehm, the cat, quote, is nothing uh, less than a false, it's nothing less than false, but on the contrary, very candid. She is just as little deceitful as the dog and never scratches while she's coaxing. Rather, she is loyally devoted to her masters. What she lacks most of all is a loving education on the part of the human and to make her, to make her an entirely amiable animal. So um, Alfred Edmund Brehm um, um, has written uh, um, most of the or one of the most popular um, natural histories of the 19th century, the um, Illustriertes um, Tierleben. So um, this kind of literature um, that um, Brehm, Brehm um, published was part and parcel of every um, household in the 19th century, in Germany at least. Um, so for Brehm, um, the cat is a misunderstood creature in zoological discourse. So far, it has been um, scratchy, so to speak, because it has been treated in a wrong way. Um, very similarly, um, uh, another proponent of cats, um, uh, he calls himself, himself actually a cat panegyrist um, and an, um, writing an apology of, um, of cats, for um, this um, natural historian, um, Gustav Michel, Hoffmann's literary cat is even um, cited to support the argument that cats are clever animals. Yeah? He writes, um, Hoffmann knew how to put a lot of imagination into his tomcat, while before um, and his opinions have to be regarded as sufficiently refuted by new accounts of natural scientists. So judging from Brehm and Michel, Hoffmann's autozoographical tomcat gives a more authentic, unprejudiced account of feline behavior than what can be found in the natural history books of Hoffmann's contemporaries. As a well-known text, Hoffmann's novel might not only have been ahead of its time, but can also be seen as an influential player in the re-evaluation of cats convincing readers of feline qualities while also shaping Brehm's and Michel's arguments. Moore is proof that Buffon is wrong. So how does he do that? 
In Buffon's generic account, cats do neither attach themselves to humans nor do they ever frequent the, so the social and working spaces within the house. The feline narrator of Tomcat Moore, however, who had been rescued from Darning and, by, and brought up by a character called um, Master Abraham, tells a very different story. Not only does this cat roam around the house from cellar to attic, Moore even goes in and out of his master's study, where he also partakes in Abraham's work. Moore tells us that Abraham was um, um, even pleased when he was working, that he was um, jumping and settling down along the papers before him. And if he was studying at his desk, he would let me sit behind him on his chair. Moreover, this cat is pampered and groomed by Master Abram, who, as Moore relates, quote, spared no pains in brushing me clean with a soft brush and then combing my fur with a little comb until it shone, unquote. He sleeps on a cushion with uh, stuffed with horsehair and is nourished by a housemaid's tasty porridge. As becomes evident in the course of the narrative, Moore is a well-established member of the household and interactively engages, for example, with a housemaid whom, quote, I often encountered in the cellar and whose kitchen also I, I also used to visit um, with um, uh, never, never without playing an agreeable game with her, unquote. So looking at the kind of interspecies relating happening between Master Abraham and his cat, we seem to be observing something very akin to Buffon's nightmare of a cat-loving, mutual amusing, co-constitutive relationship. Abraham not only calls the cat um, a companion of my hearth and home, um, and also the cleverest, best and indeed the wittiest creature of his kind ever beheld, he also finds himself getting even more attached to Moore after the cat returns from an absence of several days. In fact, the only time Moore has left the house for a longer time um, is purely um, by accident. On the cat's return to the house, Abraham admits, quote, the good creature showed not only intelligence and understanding, but also the most faithful devotion to his master, so that I now love him more than ever. Never faithless nor cunning, never, never scrubby, nor typically, um, as he says, like, quote, like other cross, bad tempered specimens of his kind, Hoffman's literary cat renounces the conventional discourse on cats, ringing in a new era of looking at and engaging with cats at the beginning of the 19th century. Yet Moore and Abraham do not only relate to each other in the study or by playing, um, for example, with a, a toy that Abraham um, fixes for, um, for Moore that is a kind of stick with feathers and um, they play together, um, but they relate to each other in face-to-face -face encounters. Um, if we want to speak with Donna Haraway, Moore and Abraham seem to be significantly other to each other, um, quote, training each other in acts of communication they barely understand, unquote, Haraway. As a matter of fact, Abraham talks to Moore every time they meet, and Moore, in return, in his very own cattish register, doesn't fail to show that he's far from ignorant of what is being said and meant. Sometimes this ends in Abraham furiously trying to rid himself of Moore's dirty paws after the tomcat had tried to bring his understanding across by, this is Moore again, uttering a very clear and melodious meow and without more ado jumping on my master's lap. Sometimes this appears as an address and counter address, a sort of mini dialogue, quote, Moore, Moore, cried Master Abraham, purr, purr, replied the tomcat quite distinctly, as we read in a passage from Kreisler's biography, underscoring that it's not only Moore, supposed, Moore's supposedly biased perception interpreting the scene as a communicative situation. 
Speaking to Moore, Abraham acknowledges the cat as an experiencing, basically apprehending subject. While Moore's reply, not his reaction, yeah, this is a reply, he replies, in turn denotes his acknowledgement of Master Abraham as an approachable and acknowledgeable other. In this respect, a do evidence is at play, a thou evidence, meaning that human and companion animal perceive each other as communicative subjects with agency and act accordingly. Despite mis misunderstandings and moments of miscommunication, Moore and Abraham negotiate their relationship and relate to each other in everyday acts of nonverbal communication and sometimes of very um, quite soundful um, and um, uh, acoustic ones. One of the several passages illustrating this kind of interspecies communicative attempts in the novel is the scene in which Moore encounters Abraham after he had been bruised in a fight with another tomcat. Got this quote here for you. I felt myself, Moore recounts, gently carried away by someone. It was my kind master who had heard me outside the door. Poor Moore, he cried, what on earth have they done to you? Oh, master, I thought, if only you, you knew. My good master laid me on my bed, prepared two plasters and put them on my ear and my paw. I let him do all this calmly and patiently, only letting out a little when the first plaster hurt me slightly. You are clever, cat, Moore, said my master. Keep quiet now and when it's time for you to lick your wounded paw, better you'll get the plaster off yourself. I promised my master I would offering him my sound paw in token of my satisfaction and my gratitude for his aid. As usual, he took it and shook it slightly without applying the least pressure. Although Moore cannot tell Abraham what has actually happened, he does not only comprehend Abraham's advice, but also communicates his understanding to Abraham non-verbally who, in turn, acknowledges the cat's comprehension and heed of advice by shaking Moore's paw. Getting in touch and being in touch via voice and body, Moore and Abraham seem to have developed their very own routine of shaping their encounters as informal meetings, a mode of interaction building upon effect and mutual affection, reaching out across species lines. So how does um, Etia Hoffmann and his own cat fit into this kind of picture? Has the real Moore been more than an inspiration for the book? As a matter of fact, Hoffmann's feline autosography ends with the editor announcing the death of the autobiographical Tomcat and therefore declaring the autobiographical account a fragment. In the postscript, the editor, Hoffmann, you know, yeah, um, he records that clever, well-educated, philosophical, poetical Tomcat Moore was snatched away by bitter death in the midst of a fine career. He died in the night between the 90, uh, 29th and the 30th of November after a short but severe illness and with the calm and composure of a wise man. It was exactly during the night of the 29th of November, 1821, when, after a short but severe illness, Hoffmann's very own real Tom Catmoor died after having lived with a poet in his Berlin flat for three and a half years. On the day after the cat's death, Hoffmann sent out an obituary to his closest friend, running as follows. On the night of the 29th to 30th November this year, after a short but severe illness, my beloved ward, the Tomcat Moore, departed this life for a better world, dead in the fourth year of his promising career. Those who knew the deceased youth, who saw him tread the path of virtue and justice, will judge of my pain and honor it in silence. I've got the um, facsimile of um, this note that um, Hoffmann wrote um, here on the right hand side. Um, it's um, Hoffmann's own handwriting and dated Berlin um, the 29th of December of November in 1821. So evidently um, the editor's postscript of the novel is nothing but a literary version of the real death note handed out by Hoffmann and indicative of what um, Wolf Segebrecht has rightly conceived of as the poet's 
quote unquote expression of a true pain in the aftermath of his loss. At the end of the novel, it seems fact and fiction, real and literary cut, have become thoroughly interlaced. But is it just Moore's death that has been fictionalized to become part of Hoffmann's text? The bi biographical information we can gather from Hoffmann's friends and acquaintances and first and foremost from the novel itself suggest otherwise. The representation of Hoffmann's literary cat as a clever, unique specimen communicating with and endearing himself to Master Abraham, who is um, Hoffmann's alter ego, rather mirrors Hoffmann's own attachment to an everyday encounter with his Berlin cat. In the letter to a friend dated uh, from May 1820, for example, Hoffmann revealed that um, a cat he wrote in this letter to, um, um, to whom, I've, uh, whom I've brought up, a tom tomcat of great beauty. His likeness is very well caught on the cover of this book and of even greater intellect has induced him, uh, had induced him to conceive the latest novel revolving around an autobiographical tomcat. So um, this um, quote and this reference in the um, letter is um, referring to the first um, uh, through this picture that was printed um, in the um, first edition of um, the, um, the novel showing um, the tomcat on the roof um, writing his autobiography. Moreover, Hoffmann's friend Hitzig um, affirms in his biography on Hoffmann that the poet was indeed inexhaustibly, inexhaustible in relating stories about the clever, I think I've got this here, yeah, um, so Hitzig about Hoffmann, it was inexhaustible in relating stories about the cleverness of his darling, who usually rested on the drawers of his master's desk, which he opened with a pause, with his paws all by himself. The literary cat's regular settling down on Master Abraham's desk, on which he lies down in the midst of papers, producing a sensation of, quote, indescribable delight, unquote, seems nothing but a descriptive counterpart of what Hoffmann himself was accustomed to from his own Berlin study. Adding an interpretive layer to the descriptive depiction by empathetically explaining the cat's behavior as a feline experience of pleasure, Hoffmann gives narrative voice to the cat's alleged thoughts and feelings, mental and emotional capacities. He also described to his own cat sprawled out before him on his desk. As he, to speak with um, Aaron Moe again, quote, discovered innovative breakthroughs in the form through an attentiveness to another species bodily poiesis, yeah, so um, this kind of zoopoetics, Hoffman conceived a more than human novel ripped up in form and scratchy on anthropocentrism. What we can infer from Hoffmann's letters and the note um, is um, that he found his cat a communicative experiencing thou, a do, yeah, uh, with do evidence, an always already autobiographical self. The life and opinions of the Tomcat Moore thus presents itself both as an illustration of what Hoffmann conceived of as his companion feline self and an indication of his own attachment to the cat. Hoffmann's novel, therefore, is much more than a mere satirical book with a cat narrator protagonist. It is a text which commemorates a feline companion and tells the story of more than human friendship. Hoffmann acknowledged his cat as a special, if somewhat megalomaniac, um, being reaching out and relating to him with gestures, sounds and movements a self whose perception and interaction he imaginatively transcribed into language. Attending to and attentive to Moore's behavior, Moore's life and death have become part of the novel. I'm gonna um, conclude um, rather briefly. Literary history teams with life narrating animals. 
Yet scholarship in animal studies has just begun to investigate the connections between real and literary animal subjects in animal autobiographies. Furthermore, so far, animal representations in these texts have rarely been contextualized with the situated knowledges of animals circulating at the time these texts were and are conceived. If we want to find out what animals mean in the history of animal autobiography, it is worthwhile not only to explore the literary and philosophical intertexts of animal life writing, but also to inquire into popular and zoological discourses. Autozoographical research follows animals' lives beyond the text by examining the, the zoological horizons of animal life writing, as well as the relations between human writers, narrating animals and animal protagonists. Literary autozographies reflect and partake in cultural imaginations, but also give form and contribute to zoological discourse. I have tried to give a glance at what might be gained from correlating zoological literature with literary, literary autozoographies. In this respect, the life and opinions of the Tomcat Moor gives its own opinions and revisions on feline nature in general, the life of a special individual in particular. Not only does the text present its readers with a cat that belies the disparaging accounts concerning domestic cats in natural history, it is also part and parcel of what became a new way of speaking, writing and interacting with cats. As a sympathetic and a communicative agent, Moore engages with his environment by means of his body and voice. Master Abraham, in turn, acknowledges Moore as an intelligent, amiable thou, and thus manages to interact with the tomcat on a bodily and acoustic basis. These interactions anticipate the um, re-evaluation of cats during the second half of the 19th century, and they also reference Hoffmann's own engagement with and affections for his Berlin cat. As a reading of the novel alongside documents on Hoffmann's um, uh, biography shows, Tomcat Moore and his relation to Hoffmann have been thoroughly encoded in the text. Hoffmann considered his Tomcat an extraordinary and endearing companion, a feeling, thinking and responding personality. The literary version of this consideration can be traced in the text, be it in the interactions between Moore and Abraham or in the representation of the cat as a responding agent. Having lived with and been attentive to, uh, to Moore's poises, Hoffman could not find it hard to represent this feline character. A self, yet not an entirely selfish character. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop my... Oh, but, but, but let me just um, briefly note what, what, you're, what you're seeing. Um, this is actually um, um, another note by um, Hoffmann that he um, put into a letter um, around 1820. Um, and scholarship is not sure whether he has picked up something um, from the cat that the cat had actually drawn himself, yeah, um, and then uh, Hoffmann put his um, his signature underneath, or whether um, some even suggest that when the cat was dead, he he took the paw and and painted um, these kinds of blots, yeah, and then wrote uh, the signature Katamur. So we don't know, but this is something that um, Hoffmann actually played with this kind of insecurity, but also this kind of a uh, notion that um, this is more as an artist and. Um, Quite funny and, and even even not 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 only funny, but it's also um, indicative that some of the uh, libraries now list um, author for this kind of um, 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 scripture. Um, this um, is um, written by um, uh, Hoffmann, but the artist, so the, the section artist, um, is saying Carta Moore, um, and I think this is quite quite nice in in this respect. So now I'm gonna end. Um, the, my slides and um, looking forward to um, questions, um, discussions, um, criticism. Yeah. <laughs>
So I would say thanks a lot. Uh, that was a fascinating talk, highlighting um, these intricacies between the borderline um, humans and animals, and how uh, the the anthropocentric gaze then kind of changes when we look at um, uh, autobiographical narratives of animals. Um, I'm sure many of us have a lot of questions. I would like to start with two questions. Um, which have come now from YouTube. Um, the first question is, uh, in what kind of a rapport do anthropomorphism and autozoographies find themselves? Is it safe to assume that anthropomorphism is an inevitable component of animal autobiographies? So, um, Frederica, I think you you have to unmute. Yeah, sorry, um, classic. Um, I think this uh, very. Thank you for the um, the question. Um, this is um, still something of a um, not not debatable, but also but something that we um, have to um, um, think about carefully when um, in talking about anthropomorphism, anthropocentrism, when talking about literary autobiographies. Um, of course, anthropomorphism cannot or well, is inevitable in um, if we uh, look at um, the text being text, right? I mean, as soon as um, uh, a text attaches an eye, yeah, um, um, in, in language, whatever language you you have it, um, you you're inside of anthropomorphism. But I think what I try to to highlight with um, the um, trans species acts of speaking for there is a continuum um, on which we can um, um, classify or assess different kinds of um, speaking for. They are all in a sense anthropomorphic, but some of them are um, more anthropocentric than others. Yeah, and I think another um, distinction that I found uh, quite helpful in my um, research is the difference um, between naive and reflective uh, anthropomorphism on the one hand and between um, epistemological and an ontological anthropocentrism. The epistemological anthropocentrism is just acknowledging that we as humans cannot not think and every other uh, or right in other terms than being than human, yeah. But um, this is not a stance that um, puts humans on top or superior to other life forms, yeah. This would be the ontological anthropocentrism. Um, um, people writing um, about or with animals to um, 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 express superiority, ontological superiority. Um, 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 in in, reg uh, in regard to to other animals, um, and this is what um, um, might be helpful to um, not say, well, this is very this is anthropomorphic rubbish, but we can actually analyze these kinds of different acts of speaking for um, that transgress um, species lines in human centric, anthropocentric um, kind of um, um, ways of speaking, and also. Um, um, in terms of um, a more uh, chipping in, which um, sees animals as um, being or having their own perspective, having a life that is worth telling, um, and so on uh, and so forth. And I think it's, anthropomorphism um, is um, as soon as you you are stuck in language. Yeah, I mean other forms of artistic um, research as well, and also artistic engagement with animal lives can um, issue this kind of um, um, anthropomorphism because it's not language based, but literary literature is just um, in this respect always anthropomorph anthropomorphic. But I don't think this is a problem or this has to be a problem. Yeah, but because there are different um, approaches to narrating animal lives from a first person perspective. I hope this um, answered the question at least a little bit. Um, yeah, so the second question is uh, from Prashant Pandey from uh, CGS J Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, Goethe's Faust also has animal figures. For instance, the dog following Faust from the street to his room. These animals also have their voice in this work. 
um, if I have understood Faust correctly. Can these animals be considered as literary animals in the context of animal studies? Um, of course they can. Um, as soon as an animal appears um, in the text, um, we, we, have, we are concerned with literary animals. Yeah? And of course, this kind of animal can then be interpreted um, in the context of the novel and has, of course, Faust, Faust's poodle has a very specific, also anthropocentric um, 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 notion because it, it is not an animal. Yeah? It's, it's, it's something um, that transforms and then we, we would learn that um, it's not actually a poodle, but um, the devil itself and so on and so forth. But um, what I think is, um, is interesting in um, talking about um, um, animals in literary texts is um, how do we know that um, there is an animal in the text? Most of the time um, we have to assume because the text tells us, yeah, it says poodle. Yeah? And so what happens is we, we as readers um, have um, acknowledge the text, approach the text with our own poodle poodle minds, so to speak. Like, what do we know about poodles? And then we um, try to get our, our way into um, the text. And what um, animal studies tries to do is um, maybe detach us a bit from this kind of um, spontaneous um, acknowledging that this, this is a poodle and this is everything we, we want to know. Um, but question um, the, the fact that um, um, or question how we can assume um, the kind of animal that we are presented with. Um, and how does this relate to historical, so Goethe's um, knowledge of poodle and the poodle in 18th century or late 18th century um, uh, society was a very different one um, than um, today. Um, there's still um, similarities because um, in late 18th century poodles were the most intelligent of all, or were considered the most intelligent of all um, uh, dogs. So for um, um, literary animal studies, it wouldn't be so interesting to um, to look at, oh yeah, this is a literary animal and um, we see that um, um, there's different uh, poodles in, in, in Goethe's, um, in Goethe's uh, um, um, work and different works of, of Goethe and, and he usually tries to um, to show or have an allegorical meaning with this um, kind of um, animals. Um, cultural and literary animal studies would be interested in um, how the poodle um, actually um, fits in to the cultural context of um, Goethe's time. Um, how the poodle um, changes um, the course of the story um, before and after a metamorphosing um, and how we can relate this kind of poodle to other poodles <laughs> in, in, in Goethe's time, but not only to, to literary text. Yeah? Um, this is what I try to, to show with um, my reading of um, zoological um, text. If we want to know what an animal means in a literary text, we have to look at other texts. And these are not poems and novels and novellas. These are zoological texts. And then we can um, say something different and something new about what it means that a specific animal is represented in a specific way. And I think with Moore, it's, it's astonishing because it's so different from what we get in contemporary discourses uh, on, on, on cats. Cats are the most vile thing <laughs> for, for 18th century. Um, and um, um, Hoffmann um, shows a very, very different picture. And this is, um, this is interesting. And it's also interesting because when we look further into the 19th century, we see that some of what Hoffmann does is actually um, happening, but much, much later in zoological discourse. Um, Again, a rather um, unwi uh, wild, wild um, uh, answer to a, a short question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that elaborate answer. So the next question I'm going to club uh, one from Zoom and one from uh, YouTube. On uh, Zoom, Christina has asked, uh, going off the question about Faust and circling back to you, stressing that Hoffman saw his cat 
as a self but not as selfish how mm-hmm. can uh, auto zoo biographies unsettle classic master slave hier- hierarchies especially in german texts and um, there is a, a sort of uh, related question from youtube uh, rinu krishna asks in spite of the interspecies understanding and communication between abraham and the cat moore addresses abraham as master doesn't that reestablish anthropocentric hierarchy yeah that's really really two really good questions i try to um answer um in 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 combination um the abraham um kind um or the master the the notion of master abraham and the kind of address that um, moore uses um is something that the other characters do as well so master abraham is basically his proper name yeah so it's not only um carter moore approaching uh, abraham as master this is the proper noun so to speak so there's no there's no hierarchy in this in this kind of respect and um talking about hierarchies and um um staying with the trouble just to speak with um donna haraway and this is not smooth that what whatever happens in this this novel and also the um kind of interaction between um hoffman uh, and abraham um it always turns out that abraham has the last say to so to speak um he is the one who goes on with a not a club but um he beats um uh, moore um several times and moore is compliant after being being beaten um and so what i try to to say with these kind of relating and misunderstanding um this there has to be well, we have to acknowledge that um there is there still is um a um uh, a notion of um superiority with humans in the novel um when we then look at the um the discourse and the the the, the level of the narrator this is more having the, the this more having the last say yeah of course it is well i'm getting beaten and i'm and i'm faking that i'm 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 i'm, I'm a good I'm a good student because I have to yeah this is the something I have to do otherwise I can't get 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 far um but um on the narratorial kind of level he has um the last say um and this is also coming back to the hierarchy and self and selfish um distinction um this is something we have to grapple with in um um the tree autobiographies um that um the narrator um is um so to speak the, the the animal and the animal that um that talks back or writes back um but still um this is again anthropomorphic um kind of projection because it is language and because it um um it um cannot be part from 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 language but again it's um crucial i think to look at what's being what's being narrated here yeah? uh, and a cat um who um uh, has a name um a name that is attached to a cat that lived and a cat that had very similar lives and a similar kind of biographical um 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 episodes than more this is interesting yeah and if we relate the biographical um information about um hoffman to to the text we can see um 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 instances in common that um um infers us to to see um carter more um as um a literary and not so literary a material semiotic um animal so it is still language it is an animal whose language depends on language on human perspectives but it but an animal um who has lived um and um um has um been encoded in a literary text and, and i mean now with 2020 we still talk about this this cat that lived in um the early 19th century i think this is astonishing <laughs> okay um thank you for that answer uh, moving on to the next question this is from salman abbas um 
he's asking are the views about the cats in the 18th and 19th century reflecting a disdain about cats stemming from the fact that unlike the dogs a self projection of human perspective is not allowed by cats in their behavioral patterns and also is the genre of autozoographies comparable to writings in prose and especially in poetry by men about women creating a so called idyllic or corrupt versions of them in the process Okay, two very um, different um, questions. I think um, you're absolutely right when you say that um, uh, the disdain and the um, disparagement um, uh, of cats uh, stems from the fact that um, cats um, are not as approachable and not as um, kind of interactive um, as, as, as dogs are. This is also what 18th century and also um, uh, um, um, uh, a number of 19th century um, zoologists um, hate about um, cats, they don't respond. And if they respond, they scratch. Yeah. Um, and of course, as you also um, rightly indicate, um, these are um, also, if you, if you look at the, the, the quotes very carefully, they judge cats and dogs from moral and so from a human centered perspective yeah it's the loyal dog yeah the faithful um, always attached yes yeah? so something that we 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 um, cherish in humans as well and then the cat who is just independent wants to go off by him or herself yeah they say well well this kind of cat yeah this is a devious always up to to something kind of uh, animal these are very um, human-centered and moral kind of values that are um, 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 put on uh, animals in this respect. Um, and so um, this is something that Alfred Edmund Brehm actually, even though he's very um, anthropomorphic in different kind of um, respects, um, he challenges um, these kinds of um, moralistic um, thinking about um, cats. He says, well, the problem is that we put um, our moral perspectives of what a good human citizen is on cats, and of course, then they um, they, they, they don't do well, yeah, in our um, in our kind of thinking, um, and we have to stop that, and we have to stop um, addressing and treating um, uh, cats the way we do with these kinds of moral um, stigma in mind, because then we we cannot approach them neutrally and the way they might like yeah so actually what what they do to us like this crappy kind of thing this is our fault because we approach them as devious independent good for nothings yeah um so um these kind of um, things are going on in in the 19th century it's fascinating and, and it's um, good for another talk but um, i'm not going to go into uh, detail on that and the second question um i was um um because you, you brought up two um, different um, aspects, I think, which um, um, I would have to, to, to ask the question back, whether um, um, poetry about or the role of female in, 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 or, or men and, and fem uh, men and, and women in, in um, prose and, and poetry is um, something that we can compare to literary autosographies. Um, my understanding of, of the, the, the genre that I try to uh, discuss with you is very um, normalistic, so to speak. Yeah, because what I was interested in in my work was well, there is the genre of autobiography being becoming absolutely popular at the end of the nineteenth of the eighteenth century, and at the same time, people um, start writing animal autobiographies. Where's the con well? This is the connection, and so my kind of approach from a from a genre kind of um, um, thinking was um, to to look at where's the difference between human autobiography, also in a very um, aesthetic kind of sense, in a poetological kind of sense, um, and so for me poetry was not relevant at all because I looked at. Um, um, how the um, genre of autobiography is um, usually um, 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 conceived of prose text written from a perspective, from a retrospective, from the person that is the writer. Of course, this is where it gets problematic because the animals are not writing themselves. 
but this is um, something that um, and it's always pros yeah this is also very kind of conventional um, uh, approach to autobiography and um, luckily there are people out there who try to broaden things up a little bit what what is autobiography it's not only um, um, prose text written from a retrospective from a human person um, so this is why I like to um, um, think about literary autobiographies and also all kinds of other um, um, texts that have animal lives as a, as a, um, taking center stage as animal life writing. Yeah, so the animal life writing is a very broad term that can encompass um, biography, autobiography, also poems that have the life of an animal as um, the the subject. Um, but I wouldn't. Um, I mean, this is a, just a different research question, yeah, to to um, to draw connections between um, poetry and gender uh, or intersectional um, um, issues and animal um, life writing. But they are there. I mean, all this kind of um, exclusion and um, patronizing um, um, butting in. Yeah. So um, this is this would be something that um, um, not only male authors, but um, generally that would be interesting to to investigate whether we butting this kind of butting in um, speaking for women would be similar to what um, we can um, 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 investigate in literary autobiographies where people speak for animals yeah um, thank you I'm, I'm, I'm writing that down for maybe the next book <laughs> so uh, moving to the next question it's a question from Chandrika Kumar um, he says it is very nice to see Hoffman's Carter more in this new light. Could you please suggest or recommend some contemporary autozoographic literary readings in German or English? Um, I have tried to uh, at the beginning. Um, can I go into my slides again? Would that be possible? And then I can. This is, makes it more easier yeah. than. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Let me see because yeah, my I had so many slides and this um, I can really recommend. Um, I don't know if I can say that on YouTube, and, and uh, but I, I just do because it's my um, my personal kind of. Um, can I do this? Uh, I have a um, I can really recommend Timothy on notes of an abstract reptile um, by. Um, Willem Klinkenberg, um, a New York, uh, New Yorker author, um, as from the New Yorker, the the the, the paper, the newspaper, um, about uh, Timothy, um, a tortoise that has actually existed. This is another. Uh, th these are all animals that have actually um, existed. This this was my kind of telling you um, that um, this these texts are actually still written. Um, and Timothy um, is, um, I think, fascinating both in linguistic and aesthetic terms. I think he does a real nice job um, not to do that, that much of butting in, but trying to um, negotiate the perspective of, of a tortoise, um, as absurd as it sounds. Um, and also tell us a very, very different story about 18th century natural um, history. He's got this um, 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 natural um, historian, um, Gilbert White, who actually had this tortoise. And this, the, 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 the shell of the tortoise is still in some kind of uh, natural history museum. And this was his, his kind of um, initial motif to say, well, we've got this object here, this leftover, this trace of an animal. Um, what's, what story is behind this kind of this, this trace? And then he tried. He started digging and found out that Timothy, um, the now deceased um, 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 tortoise, was living in this shell in the 18th century. And it's, I think it's a fascinating book. Um, and I also can, of course, always recommend Yoko Tawara in in any case, but also. Um, in, in this case, um, has been um, uh, written about and, and judged controversially, um, but I think it's a um, very, very interesting take on how to narrate um, popular polar bear life stories and intersect them with, with very, very political 
um, and historical um, issues that are um, of concern for um, all um, literary and uh, cultural historians. Um, Beautiful Joe, which brings me back to the question that I was asked before, the, the question or the um, um, the um, interrelations between between um, animal and women life, um, um, if you um, can say so, because Beautiful Joe um, is, um, I think, first published in 1896 or something, uh, and is part of um, um, not only the animal rights movement, it was also um, um, issued uh, in an addition by the animal protection movement, but it's also Marshall Saunders also uh, advocated uh, for women's rights. Yeah, so the animal protection movement and women's movement and women's rights movement cannot be um, analyzed separately. This belongs together and Beautiful Joe is quite an, a beautiful example of how this um, um, relates um, together actually. Um, I cannot really recommend Lehmann. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the horse um, thing. But this might be something um, you, you can look into if um, I hope I um, understood the question correctly. Thank you. Uh, moving quickly to the next question from Professor Babu Taliyad. Um, he's asking, isn't it still important to contrast between biographical and autobiographical perspectives in the life writings of animals like cats in the context of fictional narration or representation contrast or differentiate thank you so much yeah of course it is different um, 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 uh, important to distinguish and i hope i um i um, have done so by focusing on um, autobiographical approaches these for me were my kind of perspectives i just wanted to look at um, why do people speak for animals in their kind of perspective um, but there are quite a lot of scholars out there who um, say that we should abstain from looking at those kinds of autobiographical narratives um, because they are essentialist um, 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 anthropocentric yeah, because they are writing from perspectives they can never assume. Um, so they cherish or they, they promote writing of biographical accounts. Um, but I think this from a historical kind of perspective, this is um, not um, something that we should um, engage um, with because then we um, relinquish the, the text like Hoffmann's, which can be extremely interested, uh, interesting in terms of cult uh, history of, of knowledge and a history of um, um, emotions as well, attributing emotions to animals, but also um, um, showing um, emotions for animals um, by taking on their perspectives. But if you're absolutely right, there has to be um, a, a distinction, but I don't think it should be a distinction on um, um, terms of what's what's be better um, in an um, aesthetic sense um, than, than others. Um, the umbrella term life writing is helpful to um, to denote different kinds of um, um, writings that engage with animal lives, but of course there has to be a differentiation between um, biography and um, autobiography, and this is what I try to do. Yeah, sorry, I have to answer sh uh, more briefly. I I, I help. No, it's okay. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, so I'm so I'm trying to get as many questions as we can. There's one question from YouTube. Uh, from uh, Alvin Alexander, he says the last slide reminds one again of the psychic imaginal nature of animals in a Freudian sense, don't you think? Can you can you read the last and the, what was before the Freudian sense? He says the last slide reminds yeah. us again of the psychic imaginal nature of animals in a Freudian sense. So the the last slide which you presented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess with a with a um, um, signature um, and the, um, the more as an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you can. I mean, all the different or uh, the 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 reading of um, um, psychoanalysis in um, depicting and representing animals is. Uh, valuable thing to do but i'm i'm not really i'm just not interested in this kind of um, reading because the um 
the problem I think with this kind of uh, reading is it, it again brings us back to humans writing um, um, these kinds of um, of texts and um, projecting themselves into the roles of animals. And I don't think this is um, really helpful, um, especially not in a historical um, sense. Um, this is a is it approach to reading animals, uh, reading literary animals, but um, is some uh, a, a move that moves us away from animals again. And um, this is something um, that I don't want to do. <laughs> but thank you very much for the suggestion. I hadn't thought about it. The actually, yeah. So the next question is from uh, Akshay J. Um, I think there are three parts of this question. Is there a certain evolution of zoological research itself when approached through the lens of discourse analysis? That is, are there traces of how zoology saw and explained the natural world in, a, uh, in an anthropocentric manner? When did zoology itself undergo paradigmatic shifts in uh, how it approached nature and natural world? Mm. This is Dr. Akshay Joshi. Yeah, thank you so much. Brilliant question. Um, of course, it, it um, evolved um, in, in greatly, and especially um, if we look um, at the time that I've just um, talked to you about. Um, around 1800, the um, zoology became a profession, so to speak, a, a, an academic kind of um, 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 investigation yeah beforehand it was natural historians writing different sorts of um, um, what also what Foucault um, has um, worked out quite well um, talked about writing uh, or, or saw animals and plants and generally the natural world on a tableau so to speak it was a systematic kind of approach yeah names genre yeah so Putting them on a on a tableau, and this this changed um, in um, um, lately in the in the nineteenth um, century, where this kind of tableau was not enough. It was not as Alfred Brehm actually, and also before to some extent, say it's not what life does. Life doesn't happen on tableaus. Yeah, it happens in all kinds of messy ways. Um, and um, they try to approach um, animals from um, real perspectives, which were again anthropocentric in some some senses. But um, I think it's when you compare Alfred Edmund Brehm, and if you look into um, the Illustrators Tierleben and compare that to um, 18th or early 18th century um, natural histories, um, there's a big big difference in how you talk about animals. And this has also to do with the fact that. Um, with the 19th century, we start, or, or in, as we just in, in, in Western um, context, um, there is um, a, an attribute, um, people um, start attributing emotions, sentiments, and also sometimes cognitive abilities to animals, which was something of an unheard of before. Only um, humans had souls and reason. Yeah, this becomes challenged in the 19th century, and then it, it gets in, in Bremen. It gets a bit crazy. Yeah, um, this is just it's many many people that he's de depicting. Yeah, um, but from a cultural perspective, this is this is absolutely fascinating um, because it's very similar to what literary autosographies do. They talk about, natural historians start talking about animals as having selves, as having perspectives, as being able to remember, and um, as being able to express themselves. These are all um, features that animal autosographies have as well. Um, and so there's this, this connection which I was really interested in my, my work. Yeah, P People writing from a first person animal perspective and at the same time this is what um, natural history and zoology does as well. Not from the first person perspective, but they attribute the same values on animals. And I see that this, this is all adding up to new perceptions of animals in zoology, but also in um, cultural and literary history. Thank you. Um, so we have still a couple of questions, which unfortunately we cannot take up now. 
maybe if if so, if you if there are really urgent questions that people need to ask because and we can't do this now please write me an email um i hope everyone um has in me um see my my um my email address i mean you can just you google me um i'm um, I'm out there um, and um, I'm happy to to respond to your emails, maybe not tonight, maybe by the end of the week, um, but I'm happy to take on um, um, questions. Thank you. Yeah. So I would request uh, Raji Nair, Priyada and I think a few other people who have asked questions to uh, forward them to Frederica, Professor Middlehoff and she'll answer them if she has time. <laughs> So um, with that, I would like to wind up this uh, today's session. Um, thanks a lot, Professor Middlehoff. It was enlightening and I'm sure uh, all of us have uh, taken a lot uh, away from this uh, session today. And uh, in spite of the difficulties of uh, not having uh, electricity and all of that, finally we managed to have the session. So thank, thank, you. thank you very much for joining from Germany and all the participants from um, different countries and all around India. I wish you all a very nice evening and uh, a safe day ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.